To take a look at some of those guidelines, I'm joined by two of this year's guideline authors, Professor Leone, Professor Lamperti. Why are guidelines so needed in your particular field? Uh, in the field of uh, perioperative hypoxemic patients, uh, there is a lot of hysterosis and a lot of new device emerging, and there is a real need to, to make a point for the clinician uh, to use the best device for the best patients. For the purpose of the ultrasound guidelines uh, on uh, perioperative use of uh, ultrasound, mm -hmm. the main need from the anesthesiologist is to have a, a clear idea on when to use and uh, which is the training that is required for uh, the ultrasound. Professor Lamperti, you've been talking about the use of ultrasound to guide regional block anesthesia and vascular access. What are the main differences in the requirements between the two? So there are not so many differences, mainly in terms of training. So they are moving from uh, the classical uh, didactical training to what is called now disruptive uh, education. Mainly the trainees uh, will uh, have uh, the possibility to use uh, any kind of uh, media device uh, and uh, the training will be faster than uh, what uh, we were used to have before. Professor Leone, you've placed quite a lot of emphasis on positive pressure ventilation over conventional oxygen therapy. How confident are you in that advice? Well, confident because there is a bunch of literature now and uh, specifically uh, for the abdominal surgery patients, uh, there, there is a very good uh, publication from, from a French group uh, led by uh, Samir Jaber. And uh, this publication clearly shows the, the benefits to use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in, in those patients, in, in those population. Professor Leone, you've sometimes given weak recommendations on the basis of high quality evidence. Why is this and how should professionals interpret that in their day-to-day -day jobs? Because the, 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 the analysis of all the, uh, the, the randomized clinical trials shows that, some, that there are some limitations. And when we were not absolutely confident in the type of randomized clinical trial, in, in, in the type of population, we downgrade the, the, the level of recommendation. Which of your guidelines would be hardest to implement? And how confident are you in those guidelines? The main uh, problem will be related to the training because uh, it's, uh, mm, it will be very difficult to retrain or to certify all the European anesthesiologists. Until now, there is a lot of guidelines, but no lot of measure, me measurements of uh, guideline implementation. So we need to measure that. We need to, to assess the, the level of implementation in each European country. We've just been talking to the current and former ESA Guidelines Committee chairs. How difficult is it to ensure that your guidelines are trustworthy and reliable? Whenever the, the evidence was lacking, as uh, it happens in many of the guidelines, uh, we mainly reach a consensus and uh, the applicability of this consensus will be uh, under the supervision of uh, each institute, each uh, national entity and uh, even uh, the governments of uh, the European countries. Uh, we think our guidelines are, are quite reliable in 2019, okay? Uh, because we screen uh, more than several thousand uh, publications, uh, we select the best level of evidence, and we avoid, if possible, the, the expert opinion. All in one is, is quite uh, reliable. I'm glad you're doing such good work on that. Professor Leone, Professor Lamperti, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Euroanesthesia TV is brought to you from Euroanesthesia 2019, the European Anesthesiology Congress. For more videos from the Congress, make sure to click these links and subscribe for much more from the world of medicine.